Hey guys, the Network Burger. Hope you're doing well. So this is another PFSense video where we will specifically be looking at how to configure our PFSense firewall rules properly. We'll be discussing things that we can do to make it a little bit easier for us as administrators, as well as just to get a better feel and understanding for the firewall. So I hope you enjoy and I'll catch you in the video. So we're in our PFSense firewall and before we do any type of tweaking or talking about the rules in general, I just want to go over what is a firewall and in essence, it should be very easy to understand, but it can also be a complex thing, especially for new people that get into it. Now at its core, at its base, a firewall is just a network component that we introduce at most probably the edge of the network that is there to either accept or restrict traffic that is, that is a firewall at its core all of the other new things that we get these days like web filtering or intrusion detection those are nice to have and they are definitely stuff you want in a modern firewall but it's not like the main purpose of a firewall a firewall's purpose is to be able to inspect traffic seeing what the source and destination ips are and the source and destination ports and based off of that inspection you as the administrator can set rules to either allow or restrict the traffic and that is actually quite nice and powerful now before we also actually get to the firewall rules bit i just want to talk a little bit about how the pfsense firewall does its magic and it works in what we call a stateful manner now stateful has definitely been an industry standard for a while now most if not all new firewalls come out with stateful inspection and what does that actually mean well it means that each firewall each each time you try and connect to something you will be creating a what we call a state which the firewall will see which is going to go to let's say to google's dns server if you're trying to do a dns query and then that traffic that comes back from google to respond to you that would be a second state right now with stateful as long as you allow the traffic from one direction the other direction is automatically going to be allowed as well which means you don't need to specify two separate firewall policies to allow the traffic now you can just specify a single policy and it will automatically allow the return traffic without you having to fiddle around and that's great for us that's definitely how it should work and it should make you also understand how tedious it was to work with stateless firewalls because you had to fine-tune everything the whole time and if you missed the incoming rule and you only set the outgoing rule then that could have been a problem so it's great what we have now since there are states they are actually being stored somewhere on the firewall and the place that the states are stored is called the state table and that is in your memory so in your ram and by default the pfsense firewall will reserve 10 percent of the ram for the firewall state table so if you have a one gigabyte memory unit then you would in essence be able to track up to a hundred thousand states in my case i've got four gig which means i should be able to do four hundred thousand states and it's actually very relevant because if i show you the state table it's going to make sense because the bigger your network grows, the more states is obviously going to be needed on the firewall. So if you have a small firewall and you're trying to run a hundred or a thousand devices through it, it's probably not going to work well and you're going to run into issues. So make sure that you size your firewall correctly. I think one gig is fine for a small office or a home, uh, but for me, I, I definitely suggest maybe like four gig. That's what I think is a good baseline just to track a bunch of stuff and use some of the additional packages if you ever want to install extra stuff like the web filtering or intrusion detection or intrusion prevention now where can we tweak our states if we want to increase the limit well you can do that from your system and advanced tab and if you go to the firewall and nat tab and you scroll down a bit you'll see there's a firewall maximum states so this you can tweak per your requirement like i said by default this is set to 10 percent and you can push that up to 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent which obviously means that you can be tracking some more states so that is actually quite useful for us if you want to increase that state limit because if the state limit is reached then the firewall is obviously going to either have to drop old states or it's not going to create new states until 
there's some space available. Now to see your states, you can go to your diagnostics, go to your states, and this will show you exactly each connection and what the states are and how it's all connecting to each other. But this might be a bit confusing and really boring if you're going to have to scroll through all of this or use this filter to find specifically what you're looking for. But this is still useful information, but I can definitely suggest going to the states summary. From here, this gives you a nice overview of exactly what's happening on the firewall. So you can see which IPs are currently running through the firewall. You can see what how many states are currently active for each of these IPs. You can see what protocols are being used. There's the individual numbers per protocol for state. And you can see exactly what they've been doing. So this is quite nice as well because this gives us a great place where we can come and look at how many states are currently being used by the firewall. And if you see that's nearing that limit, you can obviously go and increase it. So that covers just the state table and how stateful filtering works. Now let's jump to the part of the video that you actually came here for. How do we do firewalling or how do we add firewall rules on PFSense? So for this, you can go to your firewall tab and you can go to the rules section. Now from here, you'll be greeted with the firewall rules section and you've got these top tabs that you can navigate to where you'll have different types of, think of this as policies per zone or interface. So you've got your WAN, LAN, which should be there by default. And then I've added a DMZ as well. And I'll go over what I do with a DMZ typically. But these are the interfaces that I have on this firewall. But by default, you should have WAN and LAN. Now, each rule will function in a sequential manner. So the firewall will read rules from top to bottom. And then depending on what you've done with the firewall, it will then allow or restrict access appropriately. Now in the WAN tab, there is a default rule that was added by the system to block all IPs that are part of a BOGON network. And this was done by when I did the quick start guide, or if I go to the interfaces and WAN, and I scroll down, there's these reserved networks, which you can click that will create rules based off of this. But I just want to block the BOGON network. So that rule will be there by default. But even if that rule wasn't there, this WAN section would then be dropping everything because the firewall by default, most firewalls, even access control lists by default have what we call an implicit deny rule. So if you don't see anything, so if this was empty, it means that it's just dropping all of the traffic, right? So you need to actually specify what traffic you're going to allow. Now, this actually branches off into a discussion in ways how you can do firewalling. There's actually two very basic ways that people go about doing it. Um, let's call it methodologies as well. And the one way, and that is the more secure and acceptable way in the industry is by blocking all traffic by default. So you don't want any rules that allows all traffic. You're going to block everything. And then based off of that, you will add rules above your block everything rule or your implicit deny to allow specific traffic. So maybe you're browsing or your ICMP or maybe FTP or NTP, those type of services so that it can be allowed out to the internet or to other networks. But it's just a good practice because I can promise you now, there's going to be a lot less things that you're going to be allowing out of your network than what you're going to be wanting to individually block. Because if you think about it, there is thousands upon thousands of different ports and that is TCP slash UDP. So they each maybe make up for almost 130,000 different ports. And then besides the ports, you have all of the different protocols as well. So if you are going to be specifically blocking everything else and then allowing everything at the bottom, that's probably going to be a very messy and busy firewall rule or table. Whereas if we have a rule set, where we're just blocking everything by default and just allowing the specific services we need, that shouldn't be as bad. And also, it's also best practice to remove any old rules that you don't use anymore. So let's say you had a FTP server, it got decommissioned, you're no longer using it, get rid of that rule, it doesn't need to stay on the table. And that's how easy it is. All right, now I just want to go over the options here inside the firewall rules tab. So if you're going to add any new rules, you can click either on one of these add buttons. The add with the arrow at the top means the rule is going to be placed at the very top, but it will not be placed above the system defined rules. And if you click on the arrow down, it will place the rule at the very bottom of the firewall table. And again, this works in a sequential manner. So any rule that first gets a hit is going to be the one that gets used. If nothing gets hit, then it will hit the implicit deny rule. 
Now to delete your rule, you can just select it and click on delete, but obviously I can't do that with the default system rule. So we're gonna to have to implement some rules. And then we have something cool that you call a separator. Now separator is nice because it allows you to basically chop up your rule sets into different sections almost. It's just a separator, um, but it, it, it just makes it look a bit nicer on the eyes when you're working with firewalls, because maybe you want to specify all of these rules are for your VPN service. And then it just makes sense in our brains what that all of the rules below that separator are being is being used for. So a good example might be I'll create a separator. Let me just give it the color of blue. I can make it red, green, or yellow. Those are the four colors you can use, but let me make it blue. And then I might might call this MGMT in, or let's make it remote MGMT. Let me click on the save button. And if you've added the separator, this works just like policies, you can drag this around and place it how you want to in what order. But I'll just click on save here as well, because if you don't save that, that separator goes away. The only pity is you cannot like edit a separator, it's just there. So you need to add a new separator if you're not happy with the color or the name. And now let's add a firewall rule. Now this is for the WAN. And what I'd like to do is add a rule to say anything coming on my WAN address. So if something connects to my firewall on it's WAN IP on the management ports. I want to allow that traffic. So I don't want this from anywhere though, because this could be very dangerous if you allow this from the internet. This is more or less, let's say you, uh, you're you working for from your office and you know what your office's public IP address is because they have a static IP most likely. Then you can allow their static IP to connect to your uh, PFSense firewall on its management port if you ever need to, so that you can quickly check some stuff out if, if you ever need to. Now, how we can add that is we click on the add button. And we're going to use this as that exact example. So we're going to set the action as pass. You can also block or reject. Block being the packets are silently just dropped. So the other side isn't aware of it. They'll just get timeouts and reject will actually give them an ICMP back to tell them the packet's been rejected if they're device supports that to tell them it's been rejected. But I'm going to say I'm going to pass it. So I'm accepting the traffic. I'm specifying my interface as the WAN. This disabled, if you tick this, it will just disable the policy, which means it will not be in use, but I want this to be in use. I'm going to scroll down. Address family, so you can set, is this IPv4, IPv6, or IPv4 and 6. I'm just going to use IPv4 in this example. My protocol, now here I can set what I'd like to give people access to. If you set this to any, then this means that they can connect on any protocol from their source to your destination. But I'm going to just do this for the management stuff. So I'm going to leave that as TCP. And now we get to the bit where it's important, where we can specify our source. Now, if you put this as any, that would mean anything from the outside would be able to connect to this IP. So I'm going to say I, I want this to be a single host or alias, and now I can specify a source address. Now the source address, I might make this the public IP, but in my case, it's a private IP, but it's since I'm in a VM environment. But this is a Kali Linux box, and this is what it's going to be connecting from. And let's say the destination, what am I going to connect to? So you can also say the single host, or you could even say this firewall self, which means all of the IPs that are bound on the firewall, if anything initiated a connection to one of those IPs from the source, then it would be passed, it would be allowed. So I'm just going to say this firewall, and now we've got a destination port range. So here we can specify what ports we want to allow. So I can make this, let's just for the example, make it any, and this will mean anything on TCP from this IP will be able to connect. So I'll just click on save, and now I've got a basic firewall rule and I'm going to just drag this below the separator. So that is below my remote management separator. So we know that this is a policy that was made for the management. I can click on the apply changes. And now once the changes has been applied, I actually want to test and see if this works. So I'll just navigate to my Kali Linux box. Uh, if I can find it, uh, da -da -da. let's just hit it here. There we go. So on this Kali Linux box, I'm going to see, can I actually access that firewall? And one thing I'm going to test to see, can I maybe ping one, 
I can't ping it. Very interesting. But I want to see, am I going to be able to access it on its HTTP portal, which is 164.0.2. And that I can get to. So I can actually see I can access this firewall and I can get to it over its management port over the source that I specified, I just couldn't ping it. So why is that? And the big reason for that is because obviously I didn't allow ICMP, I just allowed TCP. So what I could do is I could also just clone this policy by clicking on the clone button or the copy, and I can just tweak my clone a little bit. So I could say, I also just want to allow ICMP. And then it would be from the same source to the same destination. I'll click on save and now we have a second rule just remember to click on the apply changes and now we will have two rules which will basically one will be allowing tcp to the firewall and the other one will just be allowing icmp so let's see can i get to the machine can i actually ping it now so i'm back on the kali linux box see can i ping 164.0.2 and i can ping it so that is fantastic so this is two very basic rules just for remote management, but this is also very pervasive. It's, it's very open at the moment because I'm allowing a bunch of different, I'm allowing all TCP connections and it's, it's not typically something you want, especially if we're working off the basis where we want to allow very specific things. Now I'm going to show you something that's quite nice with the firewall policies as well. And we're going to work with firewall aliases. Now, what is a firewall alias? Well, it's something that you can reference in your policy, but you can basically add multiple different things to an alias. You can add multiple different IPs or um, ports. You'll see when we get there. So I go to IP and aliases. And from here, you can go IPs, ports, URLs, or all. So I'm just going to go into my ports. And here I see I already played around and created a remote MGMT port, which allowed for AT and 22. But let me just delete that and re-add another one so you can see the process. So I'll click on the add button when I'm on ports. And now I can say remote MGMT for management access is my description. And this is another point I want to make. Whenever you can add descriptions to anything on a firewall, add it. It's going to save you or anybody else that works on the firewall a lot of time from figuring out what that service or rule or something was being used for. Now the type in our case here, it's ports. And now the port, we can specify now multiple ports. I know I want to allow port 80 and I know I want to allow port 22 because that might be the SSH port so that I can SSH onto the firewall. So web access, uh, CLI access. I'm going to save this alias. And now that the alias has been saved, remote MGMT, I can actually reference that in a firewall rule. So if I go back in the rules, and I edit this very first rule that allowed the TCP access, instead of making this destination as any, I'm going to set that as other. And now I can actually specify my alias that I created. So I can say anything on those two ports now will be allowed, which was 80 and 22. I will save this and I will apply the changes. Now, if I hover over this, you can actually also see what the values are. It is 80 and 22. Also gives you some nice brief descriptions. That's why it's useful to just add the descriptions. And now it is a lot more secure. So now I'm only allowing the two ports on TCP from a source IP. So this is going to be a lot more secure. Let's quickly test it and see from the Kali Linux, can I actually still connect? So let's check from our browser. Can I connect? And the browser still works. All right, so now that we've covered how to just allow access on management from the outside, from the WAN, let's think of something that's more uh, or less something that you'd see a lot, and that is allowing access from the internet to a DMZ. Now, what is a DMZ? Let me just navigate to this tab. A DMZ is, in essence, think of it, it's still like a LAN network that's sitting behind the firewall, but it's stuff that is in there is going to be public facing. So this might be things like a file server, a mail server, a web server, a FTP server, media streaming service, stuff that people from the internet might be trying to connect to, to get to. But what makes DMZs so interesting is they are set up in a way that the DMZ is not able to 
initiate communications to your corporate or LAN networks, but your LAN networks are able to communicate with the DMZs. The reason this is set up is because if the DMZ gets compromised, so let's say somebody hacks one of those servers or services that's sitting in the DMZ, that their attack is limited to the DMZ itself, that they will not be able to breach further than the DMZ, that they will be limited in that little cage so that they can't distribute the ransomware or whatever other stuff that they have to the rest of your network. So that is why we typically see stuff like DMZs. And I highly advise anything that you want to publish to the internet and NAT down with your public IP down to your server, put that stuff in a DMZ. Don't just put it in your LAN network because you're going to thank me down the line if you ever run into an intrusion that happens really but what we're going to do is we're in essence just going to be allowing ftp access on a nat rule that we've created so here we'll do this from the wan section again and i might just create another separator and then this separator let me just make it red because this is potentially dangerous and i'll just call this inbound nat rules i'll save the separator now let's actually add a nat rule to allow ftp access so what i'll do is i'll add this and we've got the rules here actually let's be a bit smarter about this let's add a alias from the beginning because i know ftp actually works with port 21 definitely but also sometimes port 20 if you didn't know so let's add an alias for it i'll call this ftp i actually think there might be a service already uh let's go back to the firewall sorry it, it, it might look like i'm i'm not sure but I'm not sure if this object exists on PFSense. I know most firewalls have this, but let's see the destination port. It is there. So let's just do normal FTP. So I can just specify FTP as the destination port. My action will be pass. This is coming in over the WAN interface because the internet is going to be initiating this connection. And I will set this for TCP. And now we can specify source as well. But since this is going to be from the internet, because we say anybody from the internet can FTP onto our FTP server, I'll leave the source as any. But my destination, I need to specify the IP address of the DMZ. So in this case, my IP is 10.100.0.50. That is the IP address of my DMZ or my FTP server in the DMZ. Now I'm going to save this. And I'm going to click apply. And now that this has been applied, I'd actually like to test and see if this is working. So let's go back to the Kali Linux box. And I'll just quickly be on the command line and I'll just try and do an FTP to 164.0.11. That is a virtual IP that I've natted down to my DMZ. So let's see. I see I actually get a response. It's telling me about the FTP server. So this is actually already good it's already working and i can type in my ftp details and there i'm in the server on ftp my login is successful and this is because of this nat rule that was created but also the firewall rule that i also added to make it work if you don't have the firewall rule that obviously will also not work now what i'd like to do is just quickly disable this rule so that we see if the ftp stops working without a rule so let's see let's apply our changes let me navigate back to Kali Linux and let me just quit here and let me try an FTP back again. And now I cannot FTP and that is because we do not have the relevant firewall policy active. So let's just re-enable that. I'll click on this little pencil. I'll enable it again. And also the description with the extra options, I, I highly recommend filling in what this is for as well, because this will also save you down the line if you ever need to troubleshoot and you need to figure out what the policy is for and why you implemented it. Uh, inbound NAT for FTP. Another cool thing is this log that you can tick here. If you tick this, it means that any traffic that is being hit by this firewall rule will be logged onto your firewall. But similarly, as your memory usage, the logs needs to be stored somewhere. So if they are being stored on your hard disk of your firewall, then it will eventually run out of space. So don't just enable logging on anything. It's primarily used for if you want to start troubleshooting some stuff or if you're logging very specific rules that you want to make sure that nothing weird happens, then you'll use that log function. Otherwise, I highly recommend that you implement a, a syslog server type of thing where you 
export the logs to a syslog server. But for that, that's another video for another day. This is just the basic rules. And this is now just rules that we've implemented for our WAN. Now, my LAN, if I navigate to that tab, these are the basic rules that come out of the PFSense firewall by default. You get a anti-lockout rule, which is there so that you can access your firewall from the LAN on its management ports so that if you fiddle around here, you don't accidentally lock yourself out, which is quite nice. But then we have these very pervasive rules that just allow all access out. Now, this is a blessing for a consumer type of person because now you don't need to fiddle around with your firewall to get everything working because out of the box you can just connect to everything but this can also be a bad thing because maybe you have some kids and they're doing illegal stuff like torrenting and you don't want that stuff to happen then you're obviously not going to want to have this allow all stuff out and if you're going to be blocking all of those torrenting ports you're going to be wasting your time i can almost assure you so the best way to go around this is actually just changing this from being these any type of policies where we can just disable them. So let's just disable. I'll disable the IPv4 and IPv6, even though I'm not using IPv6 in this network. I'll click apply changes. And now what's going to happen is my Kali Linux box or my Ubuntu, apologies, should no longer have any internet access. So there I can see I cannot ping out to Google anymore. So how can we fix this? Well, let's add some very basic firewall rules. And for this, let's just start off with a separator again. And I'll just call this internet access. I'll move this to the top there. And what we can do is start adding some policies. Also, let's save. So let's add a policy. Let's just firstly fix the ICMP. Let's be able to ping out. So what I'll do is I'll set my action to pass. My interface is going to be the LAN in this case. Address IPv4. Protocol is going to be ICMP. It's not going to be TCP or UDP. ICMP is its own thing for pinging. We get subtypes, but I'll just use this as any. And now we can specify our source. So the source I will specify as my LAN net. Now this object is by default added when you create your interface and you assign an IP to it. The LAN net is the whole network, whereas the LAN address is just the firewall's LAN address, but we'll use the LAN net. And now our destination, I can set this for any, so that I can ping anything out to the internet. I will say, uh, I'm actually not going to add a description here because I, I think the separator is a good uh, descriptor for us in this case. So I'll just save this policy Again, move this to the top-ish, apply. So let's click save there, click apply. And now that that's been applied, I should actually be able to ping out again. So there we can see my ping started responding and I can ping out. Awesome. But can I ping something like www.google.com? No, I cannot. And the reason for that is my DNS is now broken. I can no longer do DNS queries. And since I can't do DNS, I can't do any lookups. So let's fix that as well. But with the DNS, I'm going to make one general big browsing rule. And for that, we're going to use aliases. So I will go into my firewall. Let's create a new alias. My ports that I'm going to specify, I'll add a new one and I'll call this browsing description list of browsing ports type is port and now I can specify my port. So I know obviously I'm going to use port 80 for HTTP to browse. I know I'm going to use 443 to browse for HTTPS. I will also use 8080 for alternate HTTP port. This is used a lot for stuff like speed test. And I will also use 53 for DNS. And 53 is used on TCP and UDP. So I will save this and I will apply my changes and let's go back to our rules. And now there's two things we can do. We can either add one general policy or two separate policies for our browsing out. But let's go to our land and add the relevant policies. So I will say any TCP slash UDP from my LAN network 
going anywhere. And in the destination port, we'll say custom, and this is going to be browsing. And let's just save this. And now that that's been saved, let's just make sure this is below this separator. So now we've got TCP slash UDP for browsing that's being allowed. Let's apply the changes. Uh, sorry, the reason it's asking me that is because I've moved these uh, sequences around, but I didn't click on the save button. So let's just apply now. All right, so this should be some very basic rules to get us access. So let's just test and confirm and see, can I browse out? So let's see, can I ping www.google.com now? And I can see I do get a response via DNS. So DNS works. Uh, let's see, does browsing actually work? So for this, I might just go to www.youtube.com and let's just see this YouTube open. It does, it does load the videos and everything. So that's perfect. Can I get to something like www.fast.com? So let's just run a very basic speed test. And here we can see what my speed currently is. So this is awesome. My basic things that I might be testing to see if stuff works is here. So I've got internet access out, but let's say, I've got a service, maybe it's like Netflix or Amazon Prime or something that's not working and I want to add a rule for it, but I'm not sure where to get those details. Well, what you could do is you could also look at the logs of the firewall. So you could go to your status and you could go to your system logs. And then from your system logs, there is a firewall tab. And this firewall tab in essence will tell you exactly what type of traffic is currently not being allowed or even allowed. So you can filter by those things as well if you're logging the allowed traffic. Because remember, that was a tick to log allowed traffic. But these are all of the blocked traffic rules that's being hit. Here we can see 172.16.0.50, which is my Linux box, is trying to connect to my actual PFSense firewall on port 53 for uh, DNS as well. So what I could do is I could add this rule to allow the port 53 to the PFSense address, or there is an easy allow type of thing where you can click on this plus and it will in essence just tell you basically what it's going to add. And if I click on confirm, you'll see it's added this very basic rule for the access as well, so that it will now in essence be allowing traffic from my source to my destination. But that's just a quick way to do it. It's the, I don't wanna say the, the ugly way to do it, but it, it's a fast way to just get it done uh, if you ever need to add a rule and you see that something's being blocked in the logs that you're trying to access. Um, same, like I said, for maybe Netflix. Um, let's log on to Netflix quickly, but I'm not actually going to log on. I just wanna see uh, what stuff the site opens, although this should mostly be 443. But as you know, streaming services tend to like to make use of UDP traffic as well. But a lot of um, stuff that service providers do these days is they'll have port 443 on UDP stream the traffic as well, or 8080 or port 80 on UDP to just stream the traffic back uh, to you. But yeah, this just covers a very basic rule set for your LAN to the internet. And from this, you can build off of it, please. Um, I will obviously have a reference material in the first pinned comment, but you can look at what other ports that you might want to allow on your network because each network is different. So for instance, I didn't allow NTP here. And if I was running a device that was using NTP on the LAN, then they wouldn't be able to get their time anymore. So please go through all of the rule sets that you need. It's, it's really, um, important that you understand that because each firewall, each network will practically be different. That is why they're wonderful and also why they are sometimes a curse because I, I'm, I can't just give you like a stock standard rule set that will work for everything because it, it probably won't and there will be some time that something needs to be tweaked and you need to be aware of that. Now, the last thing I want to do is just add some internet access for my DMZ because the DMZ doesn't have any internet access at the moment. So let's just go there. And this should be straightforward. I can just add a rule to say that any traffic coming from my DMZ, so I could say my DMZ network going anywhere. So to the internet, um, I'm going to allow so that I'm going to pass and we can just maybe allow anything. So I'll just allow all traffic, even though this is very bad to do. 
But since this is my DMZ, I'm just giving the DMZ free reign out to the internet. Have fun. And for this, I can quickly test by just hopping to my DMZ machine, which is a old Windows 7 machine, but it's just a VM. And that's what I was running that FileZilla server on. So let's just quickly check if I open up my browser. Do I actually have internet? Because that is the important bit. And I do. I can actually get out to the internet. But we've got a problem. Because if I can get to the internet and I allowed everything from the DMZ, watch this. I've basically caused an issue now unintentionally because now I can get to the LAN network and the whole point of the DMZ was for it not to get to the LAN network. So let's fix that by actually adding a rule to block traffic going to the LAN so that we can do easily from the same tab. So we'll be in the DMZ section. I'll add the rule at the very top. And what we're going to do now is we're going to say that the protocol I'll also make any, but I'm going to say anything from the DMZ network wanting to go to the LAN network, we're going to block. And then I will just save this rule and I will apply my changes. And now that the changes have been applied, I will effectively be blocking traffic from the DMZ to the LAN because we don't want that access. Now let me navigate back to the machine to actually test the access and see if it works. So now I see I can no longer ping 172.16.0.50 or dot one. Now I've effectively set up the DMZ the way it should be so that the internet can get to the DMZ, my LAN can get to the DMZ. So let me show you that as well, just to make sure that uh, you can see that. So from my LAN, can I ping my DMZ still? So 10, 100, 0 0.50, I can still get there, but my DMZ cannot access my LAN. So it's limited in its own little cloud, which is awesome. All right. So I think this is what I wanted to cover with the firewall rules on a PFSense firewall. I've shown you where you can go to add your rules. I've shown you some very basic rules that I can recommend that you add if you want to have management access over the WAN for your firewall, also your LAN access. And I've also introduced you to the concept of a DMZ. So I think this is a good starting point. And this is definitely something we'll be building off of on future videos where I will be showing you how to do stuff like adding NAT rules and how to work with other functions on the firewall filters. I hope the video has been informative. I'd like to thank you guys for watching. I'd also like to thank my YouTube and Patreon members and subscribers there. You guys help support the channel. And of course, you guys, the viewers, I appreciate you viewing this video and checking it out. And it really keeps me going on making more content like this because I feel like this does help a lot of people. So anyways, guys, I'll catch you in the next video. See ya.